All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take Isaiah chapter 27. We're going to see uh, ordering the kingdom of the Lord here. All right, verse 1, we're going to see in the kingdom of the Lord, the Leviathan is defeated. And you'll remember the Leviathan from the book of Job. Uh, and it's going to be mentioned here in Isaiah 2. All right, so verse 1. And that day, the Lord, with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. All right, so this is going to bring us back to the theme of Isaiah chapter 24 through 27 in general, the day when the kingdom of the Messiah ultimately triumphs and he rules. And so it's going to be expressed in victory over Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Um, some people out there will make the connection between Leviathan and ancient myths of nations near Israel. The language used draws on mythology, but this need causes us no serious problem. Uh, writers, whether of scripture or otherwise, will frequently use illustrative material, drawing that material from a wide variety of sources. could be nature, history, mythology, or literature. And so uh, some people will say that this, the use of the Leviathan here will show that Isaiah and his readers knew mythological stories, not that they believed them, but that's contrary to the book of Job when God himself mentions the Leviathan. <clears throat> so, while there is an illustrative element here, Isaiah may be more literal than many people would like to admit. If Satan could manifest himself as a serpent to Eve in the Garden of Eden, then why could he not manifest himself as a dreadful sea dragon? And uh, what do we know about Leviathan from this passage? Uh, we know that it's identified with the serpent. We know that Leviathan is resisting God. It's fleeing, twisting. Twisting has the idea of coiling as if it were ready to strike. Uh, and we know that Leviathan is connected with the sea. And we know that Leviathan's destiny is to be destroyed by the Lord. What we do know about Leviathan from other passage, uh, passages of Scripture is that Leviathan is referred to in Job chapter 3, verse 8. In Job chapter 41, there's a whole chapter in uh, Job 41 dedicated to the Leviathan from God himself. Psalm 74, verse 14, and Psalm 104, verse 26. So these passages will reinforce the idea of Leviathan as a mighty serpent-like creature connected with the sea who resists God and will be crushed by the Lord. And we're also familiar with the reference to Satan as a serpent in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But here the picture is of a sea serpent, or perhaps what we would know as a dragon. And the reference may be a literal reference, and at some point in history, either past or present, Satan may manifest himself as a monster connected with the sea. And certainly, Revelation also uses this imagery in describing the emergence of the Antichrist in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. All right? And uh, let's take a quick look at Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, where it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns were ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. And now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth were like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound heads was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast, so they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? All right. So eventually Isaiah prophesied that the ultimate defeat of Satan... Uh, when the kingdom of the Messiah conquers everybody, right? He's going to slay the reptile that is in the sea. All right, verses 2 through 6. Uh, in these passages, we're going to get, In the kingdom of the Lord, Israel is going to blossom. Verse 2. In that day, sing to her a vineyard of red wine. I, the Lord, keep it. I water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I keep it night and day. Fury is not in me. Who would set briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them, and I would burn them together, or let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Those who come he shall cause to take root in Jacob. 
Israel shall blossom and bud, and fill the face of the world with fruit. So in the days of the kingdom of the Messiah, the Lord's going to keep the vineyard of Israel with special care. He's going to water it. He's going to protect it. He's going to guard it constantly against all the enemies, and he's going to force them to make peace with him and his vineyard. And we can only be fruitful when we take hold of the strength of the Lord, as long as we hold on to our own strength. And um, what we really have is weakness. And so he seems to allude to that history of Jacob's wrestling with the angel of God, right? Let him take hold of my strength, which he could never have done except by the strength received from God. And so the result here is the blessing for the Lord's vineyard. And this is going to be fulfilled in the kingdom of the Messiah, this millennium reign. Uh, but if we yield to the care of the Lord, he will care for us as his precious vineyard right here and now. And we will enjoy the blessings of that care in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. And let's read through John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Don't just take my word for it. Let's just get right into the book. All right, and it says, I am the true vine and my father, the vine dresser. Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. And if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Alright, verses 7-9. through In the kingdom of the Lord, Israel is going to receive mercy here. Verse 7. Has he struck Israel as he struck those who struck him? Or has he been slain according to the slaughter of those who were slain by him, God? In measure by sending it away, you contended with it. He removes it by his rough wind in the day of the east wind. Therefore, by this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And this is all the fruit of taking away his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altar like chalk stones that are beaten to dust, Wooden images and incense altars shall not stand. So the Lord is going to show his mercy to Israel, in that even though the Lord struck Israel when Israel went astray, he did not strike Israel as severely as he did the other nations that went astray. And the Lord is going to show his mercy to Israel, in that he covers their sin. And this is ultimately fulfilled in the kingdom of the Messiah when all Israel will be saved in Romans chapter 11, verse 26. And the Lord's going to show his mercy to Israel and that he destroys their idolatrous altars and images, forcing them to worship the Lord only. All right, verses 10 and 11. All right, in this kingdom, the city of man's going to lie desolate. Verse 10. Yet the fortified city will be desolate, the habitation forsaken and left like a wilderness. There the calf will feed, and there it will lie down and consume its branches. When its bows are withered, they will be broken off. The woman come and set them on fire, for it is a people of no understanding. Therefore, he who made them will not have mercy on them, and he who formed them will show them no favor. So the city of man, representing the world system, is going to be made desolate by the judgment of the Lord. Knowing this, why would we put our hope, our confidence, or our expectation in the world system? So the city of man, this world system, will be made so desolate that it's going to resemble a wilderness with bare branches, useful only for fire. And so this is going to be a terrible judgment against the city of man, against this world system, world government. We want the favor of the Lord, right? Not his judgment. Uh, We long for his favor. But the world system, the citizens of the city of man, the earth dwellers, they're not going to be shown any favor at all. Verse 12 and 13, uh, God is going to be worshipped in Jerusalem. All right, verse 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will thresh from the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one, O you children of Israel. So it shall be in that day the great trumpet will be blown, and they will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria, and they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Jerusalem. 
So the Lord's going to be worshipped by his own regathered people, and they're going to come from the nations, and they're going to come to worship the Lord in the Holy Mount at Jerusalem. And that's chapter 27. Next time we'll take Isaiah chapter 28, and it's going to be a word to the drunkards. Thank you for joining me.